Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. Black history is written every day. It is constantly shaped by people who are living their stories out loud. Our panel for today, we have Barbara Mitchell, that she's located in Atlanta, Georgia. And Dr. Deborah Butler is right here in Paradise. And we have Sequoia Carr Brown, also located here in Hawaii. And we have a special guest, people, Curtis Jackson Jr. And we welcome to Sister Power, everyone. Aloha. 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 I love that. We have Thank a you for special. Having me. Okay, Curtis. We have a special treat for our Sister Power viewers. Let's sit back and let's listen to Lift Every Voice and Sing. <laughs> start with you. After hearing that beautiful rendition of the Black National Anthem, was what would you say, yeah, it was absolutely beautiful, what would you say is the staying power of Lift Every Voice and Sing? Well, it was written by Dr. Weldon Johnson when the Star Spangled Banner was created in 1814. The United States didn't consider people of African descent, women and other minorities as citizens. So uh, eight or five years after that, James Weldon Johnson, a composer of lyrics and his brother John Johnson composed the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing, to celebrate the birthday of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln is symbolic to African-Americans because of his role in leading uh, the United States to end slavery through emancipation um, Emancipation Proclamation. The song will later be adopted uh, as the national song for the NAACP. But to sing the song is to revive the past, but also to recognize as the lyrics of the song reveal that there's a hopeful future that might come of it. So to answer your question, the staying power is how it allows us to acknowledge all of the brutalities and inhumanities and dispossession that came with enslavement, that came with Jim Crow, that comes uh, still today with disenfranchisement, police brutality, dis dispossession of education and resources, continues to announce that we see this brighter future, that we believe that something will change. Wow, something will change. So what is it, is it about lift every voice and sing that speaks to a people so much that it's become known as the Black National Anthem? Uh, well, if you look at the, the words to the song, the first verse opens with a command to optimism, praise and freedom. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heavens rings, ring with the harmonies of liberty. The second verse reminds us to never forget the suffering and obstacles of the past. Don't need the road we trod, bit to the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope unborn had died. Uh, the third and final stanza is about the challenges of the future. They're to be met with perseverance, courage, faith, and trust in God. So the song Lift Every Voice and Sing, it was written at a pivotal time when Jim Crow was replacing slavery and African-Americans were searching for an identity. Two key events that led to being named the Negro National Anthem was when Booker T. Uh, Washington endorsed it, and then the NAACP made it the official song. So it spoke to the history of the dog journey of African-Americans who struggled through to get to a place of hope. So the song became a rallying cry for black communities, especially in the South, which is where I'm from, Alabama. But its influence reached 
well beyond those boundaries. Even during those days of segregation, there were Southern white churches who wrote to James Weldon Johnson and said, hey, we're singing your song, the one that you call the National Black Anthem. People in Japan, South America, people all around the world, particularly during the 30s and 40s were singing this song. So this song faded from popularity towards the end of the civil rights movement in favor of songs like We Shall Overcome because the song's recognition, recognition, recognition as a black national uh, anthem is actually one of the reasons it's moved in and out of favor because there were many black people who were like in conflict with the idea that they were saying well if we have marched and we have attained what we hope to be equality then we can't have a black anthem we need an anthem that links all of us together so on the other hand the song that theoretically should link all americans together which is the star spangled banner falls short of that goal all right lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring sequoia Yes. Michelle Obama says women have always led, even when they've been denied official positions of power, they've still done the work of keeping our communities together. Historically, Black women have taken the lead towards truth and justice. What future outcomes do you see for our community? Well, um... Thank you for that quote. Uh, she's right. Uh, you know, historically, traditionally, our black women are strong leaders. Uh, our black men are constantly being challenged, um, but we have to continue to uplift one another. And I think our future entails uh, getting back to self care, which, if you can't take care of yourself, you can't help your community. So I think the trend is to. Uh, know ourselves, love ourselves, uh, engage with one another in the community to ripple through. Um, but the first step of that, you know, in dealing with the, uh, navigating through the gauntlet of, uh, of racism, or these social, social systems in our, in our country, you have to know your enemy, right? So first thing we need to know, we have our history, we know our history, we know no one wants to hear our history. But uh, I found women like Carol, Dr. Carol Anderson. She wrote a book called White Rage. And she chronicles what it is about, what is it about white America, constructed white America that constantly wants to keep us down. And you notice it's always when we strive forward. One step forward, they push us 50 yards or 50 years back at least, right? So like this, our national anthem, uh, we are striving, we're pushing on where we may, we may be, but we're gonna keep pushing through. So knowing what these processes are, very important. Um, also Dr. Joy DeGru, uh, she wrote Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. She's a psychologist and she's all about self-care. And again, knowing what are these systems, how to navigate through them. And she chronicles how uh, we tend as our own community to bring ourselves down as a form, as like a, a epigenetic memory. It's like a way to protect ourselves, especially our boys, you know, oh, you know, probably excelling our children, right? But we'll say, oh, well, that boy, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's this and that. But that was what we used to have to do to keep the eye off, you know, the white eye gaze off of our, our children. So we've kind of over the generations brought that through and it kind of holds us back. So we have to learn how to transcend those type of you know, behaviors so that we can have that self-care and move forward. I love that. You know, if anyone is just tuning in, our theme for today is celebrating and honoring Black history. Nothing can stop us and nothing has stopped us and we are still moving forward. That's right. And yeah, we're still moving forward. And Barbara, I want to ask you, you know, a question that's come in from um, one of our viewers. We've seen how businesses have shown support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Some even highlighting Black-owned businesses during Black History Month as a show of solidarity. How can we individuals show and share support? I think the best thing to do truly is support them. Support them by uh, buying their products and uh, every way that you can and also buying our products not just during Black History Month but ongoing because we buy you know everyone else's products all year round so don't let it just be something that you do during Black History Month 
And I've noticed on several of the uh, the websites, I believe I noticed on even Google, sometimes at the bottom, they will have support black businesses. And if you click on that link, it will show you black businesses that are in uh, the area, in select areas where we are. So the best thing to do is to buy the products and continue to buy them all year round. <laughs> I'm so glad that you brought that up, Barbara, because Black history is American history, really is world history. And I would encourage our viewers to appreciate and love yourself every day. We cannot just celebrate in February. So support 365 years is the way to go. But I want to just direct something to um, Curtis Jackson. Yes, ma'am. And I read this. The day after the death of George Floyd, 12-year-old gospel singer Keedron Bryant posted a video of himself on Instagram singing on original song called, I Just Want to Live. And this is what it says. And I want you to tell me how you feel about it. You were born and raised here in Hawaii, am I correct? Yes, ma'am. All right. I just want to live. I'm a young black man doing all that I can to stand. Oh, but when I look around and I see what's being done to my kind every day, I'm being hunted as prey. My people don't want no trouble. We've had enough struggle. I just want to live. God protect me. I just want to live. I just want to live. Tell me your thoughts. What are you feeling when you hear this coming from a black boy? Now you're a black man. Yes. Uh, what I felt about that, I had, did hear that uh, when it came out. I felt helpless, especially after seeing the video. Like, I, I felt like, what, what can we do more as a community? Like, why does this have to keep happening? And seeing uh, other people who don't look like me in my community think this is a complete tragedy. It's like, this has been going on for centuries. It's just now everyone's got a camera. Now you're seeing what we feel every day. That's why you don't really know how to really react to this like you you got to have a comment because uh, being an American uh, we have the freedom to say what we want so if someone asks you a question you automatically have your freedom to have an opinion whether it be negative or positive but what I felt ultimately is helpless vulnerable and like there is not enough of people there's not a lot of people who look like me uh, growing up you know that's just how my life is that's something I learned to accept and seeing uh, like my cousins uh, who live on uh, my family is mostly on the east coast on my dad's side of the family and you know I try to get in contact with them like how are you guys doing how are you feeling like are are you making a movement or are you just uh, just coasting around and you know everyone's different and you know, everyone has to live their life and I just wish that I could do more but the best I could do is just be the best person I can be and help uh others for the betterment of mankind I love that because last two weeks ago our tagline was never stop showing up. So that's what we have to continue to do is, is show up. And, and Deborah, I just wanted to go back very quickly about um, the uh, lift every voice and sing. What do you think all of these people and singers here in the song, you would choose to be our national anthem? I, I, and you said lean on me, which I love Bill Withers. The question was, what do I think all the people see in the song? Yes, you would choose. You would choose to be our national anthem. You said, I think you said you would want to maybe lean on me and I want to know why. Yeah. Well, the United States has been referred to as a melting pot blended into one and the various ethnic, religious, racial and political groups within the United States have come to call it home for different uh, yet equal important reasons. America is more like a salad bowl. It's not like um, a melting pot. A melting pot is when you put everything in the pot and everything blends into one and comes together as one. But um, we have distinct cultures like in, in a, a, a salad bowl, you have a carrot, has its own color, its own taste, its own texture. You have tomato, its own color, its own texture, its own taste. Everything, the lettuce, on everything is it has its own color, its own taste, and its own texture. And that's what the salad bowl is. And it, that's not a melting pot. Uh, America is with different texture and it's different taste and combined together as one. So I think uh, the authenticity has a lot to do with it. But back to, uh, I did mention that uh, before we got on that lean on me, if I had to choose 
uh, a song to replace it, it would be Lean On Me, because Lean On Me is a song that says, I'll take care of you. It says, you'll take care of me. We'll look out for each other. It's a pledge of allegiance, not to a flag or country or creed, but to each other, to an idea of unity and community of shared burdens, you know, because the song says, lean on me when you're not strong, I'll be your friend. I'll help you carry on for it won't be long that I'm gonna need somebody to lean on at a moment when the United States you know is in the grip of multiple of multiple crises convulsed by debates over racism and injustice ravaged by a pandemic with a crumbling economy and a, a faltering democracy if we must have an anthem it should be far different from the one that we have now because the one that we have now is all about war bombs bursting in the air so it would be neat if it was a decent song, which um, a citizen could sing easily. In fact, Lean On Me would be that song because oh, it's right. modest. Yeah, yeah. That's one of my favorite songs, too. Sequoia, yes. Barbara, the both of you, what is the number one way Black people can make a substantial difference? Well, I'm, again, I'm sticking on my uh, the track of self-care. I think we cannot make any differences until we take care of ourselves, our own bodies and minds and spirits. And, um, you know, navigating through this country, Western society is very difficult, but we have still overcome and transcended despite that. And um, I think it's very crucial, especially now because we've got a Jim Crow 2.0 situation going on. Um, and we have a lot of great, uh, progress going on in our community and there's going to be a pushback and it's going to be very this is the white supremacy's last stand so i think it's very crucial that we take care of our mind bodies and spirits and we communicate with each other we uh enterprise we use our uh empower ourselves through uh financial enterprises buying black all the time being proud of our history 365 days a year Wow, yes. You know, Barbara, we had a conversation um, this week, and I just want to switch gears a little bit. And what was your thoughts after the acquittal of 45 last week? Well, actually, just uh, kind of continuing the same line of conversation in terms of Black people is know your power. We must know our power and use our power. And I went back and I looked at the charts from the uh, 2020 election, and it was 44% of whites who voted for, uh, voted Democrat, and it was 68% other. And of course, the 84% of Black people are in that other. So honestly, if you really look at knowing our power, it was the Black people. It was us who actually saved our democracy, because had we not, had it not been a Democrat in office after seeing what happened in the second impeachment trial, our, de our democracy would have been gone because they did not care about truth. It didn't matter how much proof was there. Nothing mattered. It was like a game to that percentage of the Republicans. They looked at their phone and simply knew that the facts because you could see it on the screen. It's one thing to have something where you can doubt it, but you could not doubt it. It was there, the facts were there. They totally ignored them. And that says to me that they do not care about democracy. Not only do they not care about it, they do not want it. And black people, are. Another reason there's a lot of pushback because to save our democracy, we are going to be the one to do it. Because the there, you know, there was the 44% of whites who voted for our democracy at this stage, but that was not enough to tip the scale. So it really was other, but it really was black people. And they're going to be pushing back really hard. And that was why I had asked the question earlier this week about the uh, John Lewis voting rights. I did not know. I, I did see some place where they were supposed to be voting on that today. That is going to be imperative that that vote, that that is passed. Because now they know the only way to stop us is to stop the vote. Because um, other than that, there's no way to stop us. There's no way. 
and we have so much power in the they know that actually they've always known on that and if you want to look at all of the different rights from the uh, LGBT, all of those, the voting rights, everything came about after the Black says, after we were uh, working to get our rights, everything rides in on, on us, everything rides in on that. But yet uh, the votes were still only 44% uh, percent from the, the white community. And maybe it's always been that way. We just didn't have all these st the statistics to show it. But now we as black people have to know our power and use our power and be the best at everything that we can possibly be. Yes. Just keep know our power. Yes. That's gonna the, the the more we acknowledge it and work with it, the more pushback there's going to be. But uh, so far we're doing you know we're doing a great job, and we have to keep it up. But that's how that. we know. That's how we know we're doing. We're on the right track. When they push back so exactly. hard, that means they're scared. Exactly. So it's a tell. It's a tell. It's a tell. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, they wouldn't try to uh, suppress our vote if we weren't important. This is what that's people right. have to realize. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. Realize yeah. that. Your voice mattered. You matter. We matter. So yes. keep on keeping on. You know, we want to be the voices of hope. That's what it's all about. And Curtis, I'm going to come back to you. Yes, ma'am. What is the biggest challenge? And you can, you know, tell us again. What is the biggest challenge of being a Black man in Hawaii? The biggest challenge that I've experienced is uh, expectations. Growing up uh, as a black male in uh, my schooling in grade school, uh, I was one of maybe four black people and the two of them were my older sisters. Whereas being like the only black kid uh, can pick for uh, basketball teams. I'm always the first one to be picked. <laughs> I happen to be horrible at basketball. <laughs> uh, annoying uh, rap lyrics or rap songs. I, I know some. <laughs> so a lot of people expect a lot thing of things for me, and I've decided to be mediocre at just about everything. But uh, it does give me a power and opportunity to understand other people. Because they're trying to understand me, they expect things from me. So I, I understand what they're thinking. Like, okay, this is what you've been taught. This is what you've been uh, grown to learn. You think this of me. I'm going to show you something different. I'm not just a black man, I'm Curtis. I, I, have, I have two loving parents, I have a loving sister that I was raped by my grandmother. I'm not just a black man, I am a person. I love that. And you know, you. I feel you, I feel you because I, I felt here in Hawaii, sometimes we're invisible. Yeah. Yeah, and we're just invisible. So we- Very we, well said. Yeah, yeah, people like to well look said. the other way. Yeah. yeah, it's a passive aggressive, right? They, they, they know, they get it because they have their own way of, you know, indigenous, the Hawaiian sovereignty, and then you have our Asian, you know, and they've got that model minority thing to deal with where they're like adjacent white and they're tolerated because they're the most tolerable of all the minority groups, right? But then the consequence of that is that they look down on us, on black and brown hispanic right that they feel like they're better than so almost like well if the white power structure isn't looking at us they prefer us you know they kind of ride with that and then push us down and mm -hmm. um it's it's unfortunate you know it's very passive aggressive here i found but and a lot of tropes it's like they take in the mainland culture more than they want to admit yeah, I can remember when I first started here as a school teacher, I started on Maui and um, my students weren't used to being around black people. And so they would ask me questions like, Miss, do all black people cuss? I said, you never heard me cuss, but do all black people carry guns? Well, I'm not packing. <laughs> well, and then they, and they would say, well, Miss, uh, what are you mixed with? And I would say, I'm half rock wild and half pit bull. <laughs> I, can I love that. Yes. I, I, they, I, I learned a lot from the culture, and I think my students learned a lot from my culture. There was only one African American student in that school, and I would keep him after school and just corn roll his hair and share stories with him because he was oh, born I, and raised there. Wow, I love that. Well, in closing, 
everyone. This has been so wonderful. We're celebrating and honoring Black history. Nothing can stop us. And I want to leave us with this quote from Michelle Obama. Do not ever let anyone make you feel like you don't matter or like you don't have a place in our American story. Because you do. And you have a right to be exactly who you are. So Barbara, Deborah, Sequoia, and Curtis, thank you so much for joining Sister Power. And take care of yourself and each other. Aloha. I feel like we just got started. <laughs> <laughs>